The Shadow, written by Captain Patriot 97. My name is Paul. I'm a licensed psychologist. I live and work in a major metropolitan located in the Midwest of the United States. I believe that most would call me experienced and capable in my field of study. In the 12 years that I've worked as a psychologist, I've seen many different patients that have all experienced a myriad of symptoms and disorders. I've worked with so many patients that they start to blend together. However, there is one patient that I will never forget. One patient that has been permanently burned into my memory. The thought of him leaves a bad taste in my mouth like a rotten apple. Even thinking about him and his condition right now, it sends chills down my spine. The patient, let's call him Jonathan, was not technically my patient to begin with. He was the patient of a colleague of mine, a good friend, who was tragically killed in a freak car accident. Jonathan was a young man who had grown up in the city and was now attending the state university. When I first met him, there was nothing particularly noticeable from my initial observation of him. He seemed like any normal young man attending university, but I knew enough that even the worst conditions might not have visible appearances. I began meeting with Jonathan in the midsummer of this past year. We started meeting every other week, and for the first two months, everything seemed fairly normal. At least as normal as meeting with a shrink goes. Jonathan seemed to present symptoms of repressed childhood emotional trauma. He had some difficulty in navigating certain social environments, and he had a difficulty in expressing appropriate emotions. He also appeared to be practicing some negative habitual anxiety relief. As I said, the first couple of months remained dedicated to exposing and addressing past trauma that Jonathan had suffered from that appeared to be feeding his other symptoms. And I dare to say that we seemed to be making excellent progress. That was until he brought up the thing that tormented him the most and now torments me. The shadow. When he first brought it up, he merely mentioned it as a passing comment. We were discussing the importance of self-control when he said, Nothing controls like the shadow. The, the what? I asked, glancing up from my notes. He appeared pale, and there was a fright in his eyes that I'd never seen before. He appeared to be looking towards one of the darker corners of my office. What did you say? I said when he failed to answer my first question. Realizing that he was being observed, Jonathan looked away from the corner, back towards me, quickly changing his demeanor to a much more pleasant and engaging tone. Nothing important. He replied with a smile, although I could see a slight tinge of fear remaining in his eyes. Okay, remember that you can share whatever you need to with me. It's important to be open so that we can address everything that needs to be addressed. I know, he said with the same smile. I waited about a minute to see if Jonathan would expand on the shadow comment but he remained silent, simply looking at me in a pleasant manner. I then proceeded to make a note about the comment for the time being and started to ask about other things before our meeting was over. By the time of our next meeting, I had nearly forgotten about the comment altogether, had it not been for the note that I had made. On the day of our next meeting, before Jonathan arrived, I was relaxing in my office by reading the newspaper and having my third cup of coffee for the day. I also had the window next to my desk open to let in the pleasant breeze to help stifle the heat of the day. I normally keep it closed, especially when I'm seeing patients because of the Catholic church across the street. It's not because I'm anti-Catholic or anything, it's because of the damn church bells. The bells always ring on the hour with the appropriate number of rings for the hour. 
It is so incredibly loud and especially distracting when I'm conducting meetings with patients. Shutting the windows softens the noise for the most part, but I still try to schedule my patients' meetings within the hour so that the obnoxious toning of the bells doesn't interrupt the meeting. Unfortunately, due to scheduling conflicts, I had been unable to do that with Jonathan in my meetings for that day, but I had hoped that it wouldn't cause too much of an issue for him. As I was taking a sip of my coffee, I heard a knocking on my office door. I glanced at my watch. It was still more than 10 minutes before we were supposed to have our meeting. Strange, I thought. He's normally not this early. Sighing to myself, I set my coffee down and walked over to the door and opened it. Jonathan stood on the other side, but he looked different than when I had last seen him. He was slightly pale, and his eyes looked red and glassy as if he had been crying. Are you all right, Jonathan? I asked with concern. Yeah, yes, Doc. I- I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I've just had a long couple of weeks. He replied, his voice trailing off as if his mind were somewhere far away. Well, come in and let's see if we can discuss it for a bit. I stated as I stepped out of the doorway and motioned for him to come into the office. He walked in and immediately sat down in his usual chair. I hurriedly went over to my cabinets and retrieved my notes for Jonathan before setting myself down in the chair across from him. At first, the meeting carried on like our previous meetings, but I could tell that Jonathan was holding something back. He kept looking away from me, towards the corners of my office. He also seemed to get distracted quite often, answering my questions abruptly without substance. I let it carry on like this for about 15 minutes or so before I decided to ask him about it. Jonathan, are you sure that you're all right? You seem distracted today. He looked at me at first like a child would their parent when first learning to ride a bike without training wheels and then he answered, Doc, the last time you said that I could share whatever I wanted in order to be open. Is that still true? Of course, I replied. I'm only able to help you as far as you can be honest with me. He looked down and let out a long sigh, crossing his arms over his chest. A common protective gesture. After almost a minute of silence, he looked back up at me and asked, Doc, d do you believe in ghosts and evil spirits? The question caught me off guard. I am not what most people would call a spiritual man, and at the time, before everything happened, I most certainly did not believe in such things. I think everyone contextualizes emotion and fear in different ways, I replied, one of which can be through the form of evil spirits. Jonathan seemed to pause and think on my response, and then he asked, what does an evil spirit look like? Again, the unusual question threw me off. What does an evil spirit look like? I thought to myself. How am I supposed to answer that? A red devil with horns and a pitchfork? Well, I suppose different cultures have different ideas about what one looks like. I replied with my best educated response. He glanced back towards one of the corners of my office. Do any of them say that it looks like a shadow? I sat there dumbfounded. A shadow? I glanced over to the spot where Jonathan seemed to be looking. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I had had previous patients who had seen different things that weren't really there. One guy used to say that he saw the clown from his seventh birthday party everywhere. These cases presented a clear break from reality that could be treated with medication and care. I don't know what it was about Jonathan, whether it was the way that he said it or the way that he looked, but he looked sane. 
he sounded sane. Like he wasn't just imagining the shadow. Suddenly, for no good reason, I felt afraid. Do you think you're seeing an evil spirit in the form of a shadow? I asked as calmly as I could. Slowly, he began to nod his head, his face seemingly getting paler. I swallowed hard before asking, Do you see one now? He shook his head no. I surprised myself by making an audible sigh of relief as I relaxed in my chair. I shook my head. This is ridiculous. I'm a licensed psychologist and an adult. I shouldn't be letting any of this get to me. I cleared my throat before bringing my pen to my notepaper and asking, When do you see the shadow? Lots of places. It follows me around. He responded, looking back at me. What does the shadow do? Does it just follow you around? I asked, digging deeper. No, he said. It moves on its own. It, it tries to control me, to scare me, to hurt me. He answered, his voice trailing off again. What shape does the shadow take? I asked. He opened his mouth as if to answer, but then stopped and closed it, remaining silent. Jonathan, I asked, leaning closer. Me, he stated. It, 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 it looks like me. It's my shadow. His voice's volume was barely above a whisper as he once again looked over to the darkened corner of the office. I stared at him speechless, pen in my hand and my notepaper blank. Slowly, I again turned to look towards the corner that Jonathan was observing. And, for a brief second, I thought that I could see the briefest of movement within the dark shadows. Then, something seemed to form within the darkness, vibrating to establish some type of firm shape. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I blinked my eyes and shook my head, but the shadow remained. It slowly seemed to move on its own, still forming its shape, moving slightly closer to where Jonathan and I sat. Do you see it? I heard Jonathan ask. I was about to answer when the loud tone of the church bells shook the entirety of my office. I dropped my pen and notepaper and put my hands over my ears. The noise was deafening. With Jonathan's early arrival, I had forgotten to shut my office windows and now the toll of the bells rang freely throughout the office. I looked over to Jonathan. Whatever pain it had caused me, it seemed to do much worse to him. He had doubled over and seemed to be writhing in pain on the office floor. I quickly ran over to the window and slammed it shut, significantly muting the noise of the church bells. Thank goodness for thick glass, I thought. I then looked over to where I remembered the shadow being. Whatever I had seen, it no longer remained. Am I seeing things as well? I asked myself. I then turned to see Jonathan laying on the carpeted floor. His entire body seemed to be shivering. Jonathan, I'm terribly sorry. I forgot to shut the window. Are you okay? I said, forgetting about the shadow as I rushed over to his side. He slowly sat up, blinking his eyes as if coming out of a daze. There was blood dripping out of his nose. I went over to my desk and grabbed a handful of tissues and then I handed them to him. He took them and put the tissues up to his nose, cleaning up the blood. I'm, I'm okay, Doc. His voice was slightly shaky. He started to get up off the floor. I leaned down to assist him. Do you want me to call an ambulance or take you to the hospital? I asked as he got back up to his feet. He seemed to steady himself and then shook his head. No, I think I'll be okay. 
those bells just surprised me is all. Okay, if you're sure, I replied. Why don't we end our session there for the day? But maybe let's meet in a week instead of waiting too. Would that work? He nodded. Good, I said with whatever smile I could muster. Then I'll see you next Friday at 7.30 in the evening. As long as that works for you. He nodded again and then we walked over to my office door. I opened it and he stepped out into the hallway before turning back towards me. Is there anything else? I asked. He paused before saying, I don't think the shadow liked those bells. Then he turned and walked away. I stood there, office door open, staring out into the empty hallway. What was that supposed to mean? I asked myself. A light flickered, causing me to quickly slam the door shut out of instinct. I leaned against the door, pulse racing, beads of sweat forming on my forehead, and my eyes darting all across the room. For the first time in my career, I regretted taking on a patient. I quickly put away my things in the office before grabbing my coat and car keys and rushing out of the door, barely pausing to lock it. I hurried down the stairs and entered the parking lot, reaching my car the fastest I think I've ever done before. I unlocked my car door and nearly dove into the driver's seat. I turned the key in the ignition, only to receive the noise of my engine sputtering, failing to turn over. Damn car, I thought to myself. Realizing that I was sweating with anxiety, I paused and took a deep breath to relax. While doing so, I made a casual glance in my rearview mirror. And that's when I saw something strange. It looked like Jonathan, but in shadow form, sitting in my back seat, vibrating just slightly. I quickly spun around in my seat almost without thinking only to find the back seat empty. No shadow. No Jonathan. I looked back towards the mirror and I simply saw the emptiness of my vehicle. What is the matter with me? I thought to myself. I turned my key again and the car's engine rumbled to life. I quickly drove out of the lot and made my way home. Once home, things were not much better. I kept seeing things, shadows seemingly moving on their own. My lights seemed to flicker constantly, and the darkness surrounding me hostile, dangerous even. I felt a type of presence that felt malicious. It was… it was suffocating. I tried to get to sleep that evening, but it was nearly impossible to relax enough to do so. When sleep finally did come, it was restless and discomforting. And the nightmares. It felt like I was dreaming the same thing again and again. I kept seeing the shadow, in the form of Jonathan, approaching me. Its black, tendril-like fingertips reaching out to me. All the joy seemed to evaporate from the air leaving only fear and pain. I would try to run, to escape from it, but the shadow would always catch me, its hands seemingly both mist and solid at the same time. It grabbed my throat, overpowering me, choking me. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. It seemed to form a malicious smile despite its empty face. And then... The dream would start again, and I would experience the terror all over again. Thus my life remained like this. Jumping at shadows, feeling like I was constantly being watched. Sleep nearly non-existent due to the nightmares. I felt no happiness, only fear, anxiety, and restriction. By the time a week had passed and it was time for my next meeting with Jonathan, I was a wreck. My life had been turned into a crushing nightmare, 
all because of Jonathan and his shadow. I had come to the resolution as I made my way up the steps to my office that this meeting would be the last I would have with Jonathan. I couldn't continue with him. I would come up with whatever excuse I needed to, workload, family, whatever. All that was certain was that I would tell him to find a different psychologist. Jonathan arrived about five minutes early to the meeting. When I opened the door, I noticed that he looked considerably better than last time. He showed no signs of the fear that he had had last week, and his face was the right color. He appeared well-rested and vibrant. He looked at me with a huge smile. I wished I could have said the same thing about me, but I felt awful. I must have looked it as well because when I greeted him at the door, Jonathan asked, Are you feeling okay, Doc? You look unwell. It's been a long week. Please come in. I tried to say with a smile. He came in and sat down. I grabbed my notes and joined him. I sighed deeply as I sank into my chair, wiping the sweat that formed on my brow with my shirt sleeve. Are you sure you're all right, Doc? Jonathan questioned again with a tone that seemed to register as pity. I... I just haven't been sleeping well is all, I replied. Seeing the shadow will do that to you. He said, a consoling smile forming on his face. Dr. Malcolm experienced the same thing when I told him about the shadow. Malcolm, his previous psychologist and my colleague who had died in the car accident several months ago. I looked at him speechless, unsure of how to respond. Did something more than an accident happen to Malcolm? I have to hand it to you, Doc. Our meetings have really helped a lot. I've realized that the Shadow doesn't like it when we resist. Everything gets a lot easier if you just give it the control that it wants. He said with an air of surety. The lights seemed to flicker for a moment in the office. The Shadow's playing against the wall. Finally, I found my voice, but it came in a stutter. D -d -d Did something happen to D Dr. Malcolm besides the car accident? Jonathan looked at me as a child would a new toy. The shadow wanted to have control, and Dr. Malcolm denied it that, so there were consequences. He paused before continuing. The question is, Doc... Are you going to make the same mistake? At this, I dropped the pen and notepaper I had been holding and I stood up from my chair. At the same time, all the lights within the office went out. My heart pounded in my chest and my breathing became rapid and hushed. As I stood there, staring at the still-seated Jonathan, shadows began to dance around the room. A particular shadow seemed to appear around Jonathan as he looked up at me from his chair. There's no escaping it, Doctor. The shadow will get whatever it wants. It always does. His voice became a sinister whisper. I stood in front of him, unable to move, to scream, to do anything. I could just simply watch as the shadow around Jonathan grew larger and more defined. Then it stood up on its own, seemingly releasing itself from him. The shadow slowly glided around Jonathan's chair, making its way towards me. Its darkened form vibrating with what seemed to be excitement. I looked at its dark, expressionless face and I saw the same malicious, terrifying smile from my dreams. I can't remain still, I thought to myself. Somehow, motion returned to my extremities and I was able to move again. I turned to run to my office door to escape this horrific thing in front of me. 
but I was too late and my legs were swept out from under me. I fell on the office floor hard and turned in time to see dark, shadowy tendrils return to one of the arms of the shadow. I whimpered as it began to move closer towards me. I could sense the evil emanating from it. I started to crawl towards my desk, just trying to do whatever I could to separate myself from whatever this was. I then felt an intense pain in my right leg, like I was being mauled by something with strong, sharp claws. I could feel my flesh get torn apart and blood began to soak my pant leg. The more you resist, the more painful it's gonna be, Doc. I heard Jonathan say from behind the shadow. I began to weep, sensing my final end arriving quickly. But then I heard it. The distant tone of metallic clanging. Trying to sound through the closed office window. The church bells. I remembered what Jonathan had said about the church bells. I needed to get free and open the window. Looking back towards the shadow, I could see that it had wrapped one of its dark extremities around my leg. I kicked and shouted through my tears, Get away from me! It tightened its grip on my leg, cutting deeper into my flesh and causing fresh blood to ooze from the wound. I billowed in pain. Still, I was determined to escape, and so I kicked and kicked as hard as I could against this seemingly solid black mist. Somehow, by some miracle, I broke free from its shadowy claws. I scrambled up, ignoring the searing pain in my leg as I hobbled over to the window. I could still hear the muffled chimes coming from the church as I gripped the window latch. Go to hell! I screamed as I threw open the window. The office became engulfed with the thunderous noise of the ringing bells. No! I heard Jonathan roar from behind me. I turned to look at him and the shadow. Jonathan was on the floor, hands over his ears, body shaking violently. The shadow also had its black tendrils over its own ethereal ears. It shook as well, even more aggressively than Jonathan. It looked as if it were being torn apart by the resounding blast of the church bells. Shreds of its sinister darkness seemed to be stripped away with each tone of the hour. It seemed as if it was howling silently in pain. It appeared to collapse to the floor alongside where Jonathan lay before completely disappearing before my eyes. The lights within my office came back on as the church bells made their final toll of the hour. I stood there, gripping my desk to steady myself as I felt weakened by the pain and the damage to my leg. The sound of the bells still rung in my ears, but I didn't care because as far as I could tell, the shadow was now gone. I looked over at Jonathan. He had stopped moving and now lay motionless on my office floor. I could see blood trickling from his nose and ears, seeping into the office carpet. I collapsed into my desk chair, blood dripping from the wound in my leg, and I wept. Then I reached for my phone. The first responders arrived within about 10 minutes of me dialing the phone. I'm sure that the police probably wanted to question me about what had happened, but by the time they arrived, I was already slipping into shock from the wound in my leg. I remember seeing them put Jonathan into a different ambulance from myself, but as they rolled me into the emergency room, I lost consciousness. I woke up two days after the event in a clean and brightly lit hospital room. After the doctors and nurses had made sure that I was fine, they let in the police detectives who were investigating the incident. 
They seemed to think that I had been attacked by Jonathan during our meeting and that it was he who had caused the injury to my leg. Despite, they said, that it looked so animalistic. I wasn't about to argue with them about what had happened, not that they would have believed the truth anyway. After I seemed to satisfy their few questions, they left me in peace. Before they left, I asked them what had happened to Jonathan. They said that he had been in a coma ever since the event, with what appeared to be significant damage to his brain. It was similar to someone suffering from a major stroke or something like that. He was being held at a different hospital than the one that I was at and was under 24-hour guard. About a week later, I was discharged from the hospital. I decided to take some time for myself to recuperate after the ordeal. Since that night, I thankfully no longer feel the dark presence of the shadow. It is as if the church bells had rung it out of existence. I experience no more nightmares. I'm nearly back to my old self. It's as if I received back all of the joy that the shadow had taken away from me in its desperate effort to control me. A few days ago, I decided to stop by the hospital where Jonathan was being held to see how he was doing. Even after everything that had happened, I was still his psychologist. It took me a short while, but I eventually found him in one of the corner rooms on the top floor. As I looked into his room, I could see that he appeared to still be in a coma and that the charts next to his bed showed abnormal brain readings. There was only one light on in his room and it cast a shadow against the far wall. I looked at the shadow for a while, remembering the terror of that night and being thankful that it was over. Just as I was about to turn to leave, I saw what looked like a small bit of movement in the shadow. I paused and I looked at the shadow more intently. It almost appeared to be slightly vibrating. (laughs) 